I think it's super important that you just said that. Definitely. I mean, I've known a lot of traders come and go, and it's because they lack the risk management. Welcome back, everybody, to Be The Trader. Today, we're going to start again, but part two, with Michael Swimilar. If you haven't seen part one, you need to go watch that, where we dive into his story, and we didn't quite finish. And you know, I know how a lot of you people want it to be the entire hour and so, or so. So today we brought him back and we're gonna dive deeper into the story and then throw some questions and just have a good conversation. Cool. Thanks for coming back to Austin. Hey, no, I appreciate you yeah. willing to do this a second time because I know it takes a lot of time. No problem. <laughs> I know it does. But Michael, we stopped on you just finishing up the poker journey. Okay. And then you said, you know what, I'm gonna get back into stocks. Sure. After the big Facebook thing happened and took you on your poker journey, sure. right? So what happens next? You're like, you think I wanna get back into stocks and trading again? Right. I think this was 2018? This was, two, no, 2014. 14, okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, you know, I was, did the poker thing and, you know, still do the poker thing, never completely quit it, but I realized there's a lot more upside in trading than poker. You know, poker is great, but Trading just has like unlimited upside versus poker is fairly capped to us to, to a degree. It was also a lifestyle decision. Ma I'm married, you know, wanted to start a family. And poker back in Texas in 2014 was a little bit like the wild, wild west of like underground home games. And, you know, it wasn't like it's become today. So I decided just to kind of jump back into trading and, and see if I kind of still had it. And, and, uh, and yeah, just jumped right in. Um, How'd you jump back in? Like, what? Was it just, was it easy? Was it like quick? Did you just trade on your own at that point? Did you come to I, a firm? I opened, like you know what, I, so I was, had only traded prop firms uh, up until then. So I just had a retail account and was kind of messing around there and had a little bit of success. I think uh, the first big event I traded was a Twitter IPO and that was a pretty good IPO. Uh, so I made some money there, but I realized for my strategy of like, I'm fairly like getting out pretty quickly, uh, used a lot of hotkeys and trading on like interactive brokers, which was what I was doing, just didn't really make sense for my strategy. So I decided to join a prop firm. That I wanted to kind of start fresh. Joined a, a different prop firm at the time and uh, just kind of started trying to, trying to get back to doing what I was doing. Um, early on, I found a lot of difficulties because in the time I had left to come back was a lot more algorithms uh, were in the market, a lot more uh, black boxes. So a lot of the strategies that we used to use just pretty much went away. So like, it sounds silly now, but one of our main strategies really was to, to uh, trade ETFs off just the overall spiders in the market move. Like there was a lag in, in ETFs, which now is absurd. Mm -hmm. Like there, there's just completely like, that doesn't exist. You know, there's algorithms that, that do that. So you, as a hand trader, you can't really make money doing that, but that's what we used to do. And that was basically gone. So I kind of had to relearn, you know, from scratch in a way. Like I still had the mental uh, psychology part of trading down and the risk management part, but I had to basically relearn strategies that would work in that market. How long um, did it take at that time? Because since you had like the mental game, right? Yeah. Did, was it easier that, at that point to kind of just get a strategy, learn it? Not really. Apply it? No. I mean, it was it's hard. It was hard. It's all it's always hard. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so I just, basically, my risk management is what kind of kept me around. Because I would never, I would never just kind of blow up. I was always very precise about my exits. When things weren't working out, I would get out. Wouldn't really second guess myself. That just sort of became second nature to my strategies. And so that sort of is what kept me in the game. Even though I didn't really have any strategies that were, you know, that effective, I also wasn't, you know, blowing up or losing money. So a lot of it was hanging around. You know, catching a few big events here and there. I think my first big win when I came back was the Alibaba IPO. I think that was in late 2014. Uh, took advantage of that. Um, basically did the same thing I did on the Facebook IPO, but this time there wasn't a glitch. Yeah. So I was able to kind of scale out of that as it went up. Um, so that just kind of kept me around. I wasn't having any like wild success, but I was making more money than I would be doing any other job. So it sort of just kept me around, um, you know, a lot, of, a lot of highs and lows in that, but just kind of basically hanging around, which is, I think is a good, um, good thing to talk about is big part of trading is just staying in the game. 
Hey, we wouldn't be able to do these face-to-face -face interviews if it wasn't for our sponsor, Cobra Trading. So if you can just give them a few seconds of your time, we'd really appreciate it. Cobra Trading is the go-to broker for day traders and short sellers. And I'm not the only one saying this. In fact, Benzinga awarded Cobra Trading as the go-to broker for short selling. They have a heavy focus on direct market access order routing, so you have the fastest execution. They have some of the best locate prices and availability. They also have amazing customer service. I've experienced many different brokers, and it's why I use them every single day and why I'm proud to have them as our sponsor. Sign up now by clicking the Be The Trader referral link below and earn one free month of software with Cobra and 25% off all commissions. Now let's get back to the show. Right, right like. Yeah, Cause I keep hearing you say like, I, you know, my risk management was good, uh -huh. it kept me here. It allowed you to learn new strategies. Yeah. Figure out what works for you. You had a lot of up and downs. So like, I think it's super important that you just said that. Definitely, I mean, I've known a lot of traders come and go and it's because they lack the risk management. They, they're not able to stick around you know, they're great traders for a while, but you know, they let one event or just, you know, several trades just take them out of the game rather than sort of just scale back and just, just hang around, wait for those, those big, big events, whether it's like flash crashes, you know, 2020, <clears throat> you know, volatility, just things like that can sort of, you need to be around for, the, for those things. And if you take yourself out of the game, you're just, you're gonna miss out on stuff like that. Thinking of those traders, though, you said they're good traders who might have just gotten out, I mean, took themselves out of the game, whether it was a mistake or several mistakes. Is there anything, just looking back, and maybe even your own personal experience, where you saw maybe triggers that could sign signal, like, hey, this could happen, so, like, pump the brakes a little bit here, sir? You know what I'm saying? To prevent that couple of mistakes that take you out of the game. I think it's just always been a foundation in my trading is don't let one trade kind of blow you up, you know, and it, what's kind of funny is that chaos counter to the Facebook trade, but that was, you that know, was completely, that was completely out of my control. Yeah. And, you know, that was, it was tough to deal with that for a while because mm. it was out of your control, but that's kind of part of life, right? You've got to deal with things that aren't necessarily things you control and just kind of deal with that. But I still had that risk management foundation where... I just wouldn't let any one trade get out of hand. Like that's just how I traded. It was, it was second nature. So that kept me from ever just having those like catastrophic like days, weeks, months, and years to kind of hang around yeah. and uh, wait for better opportunities in, in the market. So when you came back, you said you had to adapt mm -hmm. because things are changed. Like how you used to trade sure. wasn't really there anymore because of all the algorithms. Right, mm. the spreads weren't there anymore. Sure. What, maybe are the arbitrage you start to trade at the beginning? Mm -hmm. If you don't know what we're talking about, go watch the first video because he dived into that. And the Facebook thing that we keep mentioning is on the first video where Nasdaq has some type of glitch, mm -hmm. and you had a big position, and but it didn't show that he had a position at all. And you know that could yep. be really bad. So, but I want to know this though: when you had to adapt. Mm -hmm. Did you adapt but keep the core of how you think as a trader? Or did you yeah. have to adapt how you think of yourself as a trader as well? I, I, I've definitely never changed completely as a trader. Like, and that's good and bad. Like, you know, you, you get on Twitter and you see how like guys are trading, like, you know, shorting small caps that are going crazy. Mm -hmm. And to me, that's such a foreign concept because that wasn't a thing when I start learned to trade. So I never really jumped into that game. It just didn't, you know, didn't run how I like to trade. So I like, so I, I never jumped into that. So I've always had the same somewhat style, but I've always had to sort of adapt it a little bit. And uh, you know, something that people don't talk about a lot in trading is specific things like uh, the right order types. And that, and that made a huge difference for me because when I came back, basically, you know, I'm a trader that likes to get in and out quickly. What's quickly? Um, seconds to couple minutes okay so yeah. you spread uh, basically the bid and ask spread just i mean that not not that not like i'm not trying to make a two percent two cents in a trade yeah. but i'm trying to get in and out pretty quickly to, just to catch a quick move okay trying to read read the tape for stuff like that but uh discovering new order types that weren't around back then uh iex order type was like a huge change for me uh you know when i at the end of my trading in like 2011 12 
basically there's you, you try to hit an order and it just disappears mm. um there was just so many like algorithms that basically were trained to back away when they see like an order coming in if they didn't want to fill it and so it was just it was a lot of frustration so i think you know it must have been 2014 or 15 when iex came around and you know if you don't know about iex you should read flash boys which is a great story okay and give us a quick what do you mean by iex so iex is a route to where you know, a lot of other traders are seeing the same thing I was, that you want to get filled on, say you're trying to buy 10,000 shares and they're showing 10,000 shares in the offer, you think you should just be able to go and hit it and get that, but that wasn't what was happening. Basically, you'd get filled on like 100 shares and the order would basically disappear. Hmm. And that was happening, you know, over and over throughout the market. And so IEX, uh, it's a fascinating read, um, they came up with an order type that would basically counter that. So where the algorithms couldn't see that order coming in uh, like they were before, it was sort of, it's, it's, it's a little complicated. Yeah, that's interesting. Uh, no, I love it, that you said it's, that. It's, yeah. it's one of the better like trading mm -hmm. books around, actually. Um, Flash Boys. Okay. Yeah, Flash I Boys. Say, I never read it. Oh, yeah, Michael Lewis, who uh, did uh, The Big Short, wrote that book. Was, okay, cool. Yeah. I need to check it out then. Definitely read that. Um, so IEX basically made it to where they couldn't see your order to back away in time uh, and you could you could get great fills and uh which actually still exists to this day uh you know you try using an arca and yeah, they, that's what I use. They, yeah, yeah they see you coming and they just if they don't want to fill you they pull away and uh <laughs> so yeah so that was a big change uh another order type that, that has made a big difference in my trading is like using a hidden nasdaq orders yep to where you're completely hidden you're not showing 100 shares you're not showing anything they like now, if you put in a regular Nasdaq order, you know, on the offer, uh, you're going to get pennied, which means like an algorithm will jump you in front of you mm -hmm. and try and get in front of you. So you don't really get filled unless you maybe you don't want to get filled. So a, a hidden Nasdaq order basically keeps the algorithms from seeing your order so you can kind of get filled b before them. Mm -hmm. uh, so like little things like that uh, I had to adjust and um, incorporate into my trading. I'll let you say that, but I want for those... I, don't, I want people who are listening right now, okay. especially a newer trader. Sure. I don't want them to get lost in the fact that like now they're like, oh, I need to focus on like not getting skipped, right? Sure, like sure, not yeah, getting sure. skipped. So like for how how would you explain for a new trader? How would they should they take this information and be like, okay, I need to start thinking like this, or like just get some I think words it depends on your there. if you're I think it depends on your style of trading. If if you're like a swing trader, if you're a if you're in a trade for thirty minutes or an hour, it, it probably doesn't really matter that much. Right, but if you're trying to trade size in stocks, maybe with a spread like a like a Tesla type trade. Oh yeah, then I, I feel like the two order types I just talked about are pretty much a must uh, for that type of trading. Um, so you it really it depends on your style. Right there, brother, some quick. <laughs> yeah, 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 you fast on the keys. You better be fast on those yeah, keys. Fast on the keys. Yeah. You're trading Tesla like that. Yeah, yeah. It, what are you, is there like go to stocks that you love? Like, is, is, it, is that how you? focus on your trading like you always traded like a batch of stocks mainly or is it mainly like whatever is hot in the market on the big caps that day I, a combination of both okay yeah like i have my stocks i go to uh alibaba is one of my favorites tesla shopify a few like i like you know you see i like the higher dollar stocks yeah and and they have the big spread sometimes so you gotta you gotta be pretty nimble and use hidden orders and and uh just try and, be so try and outsmart the algos <laughs> that's gotta be so stressful just like how do you, like, were you always like a type of person? Like, you like this quick, like, you've always seen that I think so. And, uh, training, or? and I don't know if, uh, who you talked to earlier, Jake. He, he made a good, a good observation that I've never heard before. Is like, I like trades where there's, like, a quick outcome where you know you're right or wrong. And, that, and it goes back to, like, poker. Like, you know, each hand you play, there's outcome. And you know if you're right or wrong, if you mm -hmm. win or lose, versus, like, oh, I'm winning, I'm losing, I'm this and that. It's a very, it's a quick result. And so I've always been drawn to that type of trading where I can take a lot of risk for a very short amount of time and there's a result and, you know, and that's sort of the style of trading I've gravitated toward. So I'm, I'm taking you off track here, so I want to bring you back. And okay. this is, so you join a firm okay. to get back into it, right? Yeah. And you start to learn this different strategy. You got to relearn different strategies. So okay. you find your strategies. What happens next? A lot of, a lot of just kind of getting by. Uh, not wild success, but not not failure either. Yes. Um, you know, I, I love trading, so it, you know it's hard to hard to leave it because I was making enough money to get by and and all that. But it wasn't 
wasn't wildly successful. It wasn't some guy just like making seven figures a year, yeah. like just just getting by, having a, a decent life, but just not not being wildly successful. Waiting for you know the right opportunities. Um, so then, was any of that had to do with? And I have to ask this because you mentioned earlier the Facebook thing. Mm-hmm. So like that has that would rattle me a lot personally. And I know it'd probably be in the back of my mind. Mm-hmm. Did, was that all a factor in that coming back? Like, is you know, not really because I, the market I knew it was fine. such like a fluky event. Okay. That was, you know, out of my control. So, I, not really. I wasn't okay. worried about that happening again. It was I just, just didn't know if you were worried, like, oh, what if NASDAQ does this again? You know, or no. it could happen. So maybe I won't size up as much. You know, like something yeah. like that. No, I can't say that happened. Okay, cool. I just kind of. Figured it was a one-off and just moved on from that. Uh, so then I would say, so I was trading with one prop firm, moderate success, decided maybe I wasn't happy with this firm and just kind of look, trying to look around and see what else was out there and kind of discovered Avatar in, I think, early 2019. And uh, just just had a good uh, good conversations with, with the people who run it and uh, decided this was one place where I want to continue my trading career. And, uh, yeah. And the rest is history. Yeah. You know, what's very interesting and in what, you, what you've been saying today is the fact that it's not always a smooth road mm-hmm. when you're trading. And you've had some great success, and, but you also share that it's not always easy. Sure. And you make that very clear, and I appreciate that because – traders we always see just the rose colored glasses Mm -hmm. everything through rose colored glasses right most of us are on twitter sure maybe they don't get to talk to a trader and they're just learning by themselves at home in their computer and they're just on twitter all day and on twitter it just feels like everyone's a winner 100 percent. right and then when no one's winning twitter's really quiet you know you're not absolutely absolutely but uh when it's a rough market twitter's real quiet so like that's all they see though is winners and so when they have, uh, like, for example, maybe there's a trader out there who have maybe a red day today, mm-hmm. right? But they trade it well. Mm-hmm. But in their head, they see someone else post, right? I'm not pointing at you like it's you, but they yeah. see someone else post, sure. and they're doing great on that same ticker, but they're not the same trader. Yeah. Like, you sharing that, I think is going to help a lot of people. And I know we talked a little bit off camera where you said something like, you know, like sometimes I'll have, you know, red days more and green days back to back or mm-hmm. just off and on and right now you're on a good winning streak right and how you think that man i just don't want to that that loser could come uh-huh. right and you were prepared for it now mm-hmm. and you're more so thinking like i want it to come so i can get it over with can you explain that whole thought <laughs> process of you know what you're thinking there yeah you know what the the your worst days tend to come after like a, a big hot streak you just you get complacent and that's just sort sort of the pattern, you know. It's just basically trading. You go from underconfidence to you know normal to overconfidence, and you're kind of trying to always balance that. You're always in one of those phases. Whether you you think you're better than you are, you think you're way worse than you are, or maybe you're just you're you're right in the middle, and you're all, you're always moving. So after a hot streak, I've always had you know a big losing day, a big you know, bad, bad run, you just get overconfident. And it's just, it's so hard to fight that. And so, uh, yeah, I've had a lot of success recently. So I'm, tr- I'm resisting the urge to, yes. to, uh, to push myself for, to, you know, to have a big downswing. Um, so yeah, it's, it might be a funny thing to say, I want to have a losing day, but I just want to have a losing day that's not, not, you know, a huge day to what sets me back, just to, to get back to not overconfidence kind of thing. And this is after, and we talked via text, mm-hmm. and you mentioned you had a really good trade. Yeah. Can you explain, this was before the winning streak, right? This kind of right. started. It started the winning streak, yeah. Uh-huh. What, what was that? Uh, yeah, it was, it was pretty crazy. Um, it was uh, last, last options expiration or quad, <clears throat> quad witching day in March. What's it called? So quadruple witching day it happens four times a year where there's just a lot of options expiring on the same day and it tends to create a lot more volatility at the close. And then one of one of my strategies has been to focus on these these key days for uh, for trading the close, and you know sometimes they're they're okay, sometimes they're 
not great. Some are amazing. And so you, those are the key days you kind of focus on for, for certain strategies. <clears throat> and uh, yeah, this last one, it just, uh, just kind of watching the right stock at the right time. And, uh, you know, it was, it was such a crazy thing that happened. It, you know, it even made the news that uh, Shopify was basically closed 100 points higher then it was trading basically a minute before the end of the day, um, you know, thir closing up 13% uh, on a pretty on a big cap stock was almost unprecedented. I mean, we've seen some crazy stuff over the years, but it was definitely would be you know top five craziest things I've ever seen. And I just kind of I was in the right time, right place, was watching that. Got certain filters on our on our platform that alert us to maybe a condition that where this could happen. Yeah. Ne not to that degree, but you know. Maybe maybe five points, you know, ten points would have been a home run, and it printed like almost a hundred points uh, at the closing price, and I was able to get that closing price, and uh, yeah, it was it was a pretty crazy experience to make a hundred points in, you know, under five minutes. That's <laughs> nuts. Yeah, it that's, was, yeah, it, that's, it was nuts. That's awesome, man. Thanks. The I want to know because my is it. Something that happens often, where you're able to just to nail it, or is it something that is, is a rare event? Because you know someone's watching this and sure. like, oh man, like I want to. That's my goal now. Yeah. I want to nail that kind of trade. Talk about like taking profits for yourself. Like, is it yeah. something that's normal for you to take profits quickly, or like be able to get a big move? Like, mm. what's your goal usually? And was that more of a right place, right time? Uh. But both of those. Or is that the goal I, usually? I'm I'm a, I'm much a, more of a take profits quickly, and I've I've learned over the last few years to sort of cater to what I'm good at. And I'm not good okay. at holding something for a long time and and seeing it move up, seeing it move down. I'm good at getting in very aggressively and getting out. So what I've learned is instead of instead of maximizing profit through time, I maximize profit through size. So instead of trying to make a point on, or no, five points on, you know, small size. I'm trying to make a point on really large size. So I've just tried to maximize what I'm good at rather than maybe what other traders are doing. And so, uh, you know, a trade like Shopify catered exactly to my talents as far as being able to get and in a really large position. <laughs> and I didn't have to take any heat. It was, you know, you get in, you get out, and yeah. So it, that was just kind of right place, right time. But it was also it was a strategy that I've been, you know, trading for 15 plus years. Right. And this just happened to be one of the best opportunities I've seen for that strategy. And but yeah, a lot of it, a lot of it is just is is lucky to be happening to looking at this at the right time. And, and that's amazing. It. And and it's definitely a lot of your work of learning the strategy and keep on doing it over and exactly. over. And yeah. it's the same way you're going to execute every time. It's just this time it happened to go much higher. Yeah. And in a much quicker. I think rate. it's the perfect. Uh, Example of that, that phrase, luck is preparation and opportunity, um, just kind of meeting at the right time, right? Yep. And that, that was basically it. So for those, there are going to be someone who hears you say like, because I love that you shared, I'm not someone who wants to be in a position and see it go up and down over mm -hmm. time. I want to just nail it with yep. size mm -hmm. and take the quick move. Mm -hmm. how, do you, how can you give a caution of risk? For those who are listening, I'm like, man, yeah. I'm gonna try that. Yeah. Like, because maybe they're not consistent yet. Maybe sure. they're just like, I'm trying this whole thing. Yeah. And it, and it's always made me uncomfortable, Michael. But I just heard you say like it was uncomfortable for you too. Let yeah. me try yeah. something different. Yeah. How would you suggest someone approach that mindset if they're gonna try something like that? I mean, I definitely wouldn't advise a new trader to to take that approach. But I would advise a new trader to look at at where where they've had the most success at. And I mean, you hear you hear this all the time. Is just basically try and get bigger in your best trades, and that's really an example of, of if they've had success with trades that you know happen over a course of 10, 20, 30 seconds, and they're making money doing that consistently. Just just increase your size and and see if you can do that, uh, get bigger in that specific strategy. But mm -hmm. it's it's not about copying a strategy. It's about doing what you're you've already seen success at, and pushing yourself. To get bigger in that strategy, and then cutting out all the strategies that maybe aren't aren't really working for you. You know, 
it's just so unique how trading is for everyone, mm -hmm. right? I'm sure you've met so many traders who just trade completely different from you and you might trade yeah. the exact same ticker. Definitely. And I love what you said, just really focus on what you are really comfortable with, mm -hmm. what, you're, what you're good at, what you found success with, and then maximize that Definitely. and eliminate the ones that are not, not so great. Mm -hmm. Would you, is your, are you ever focused on like win rate? No. Can you explain why? Uh, it's just never, never been a focus of mine. I don't know. Uh, I just try and I'm focusing on risk mm -hmm. and I'm focusing on what the, what the setup is. If it's, if it's something that I've, I've had success with in the past, just trying to trade that. Um, but win rate, I mean, it's kind of irrelevant. I think like it, Really Can you explain is. why you're thinking that way? I mean, you just you want to keep you want to keep your losses small and your and your wins big, right? So right. W win rate it doesn't it doesn't really matter. Like I mean, you could lose eighty percent of your trades if they're losing small, but if you just happen to crush a few trades here and there, you're going to make your your month or year. So I think win rate, I'd, I'd I mean it depends on what kind of trader you are, but I think in general, it's maybe over talked about and it's not as as relevant as. It's just, you know, having your winners bigger than your losers. And it's as simple as that, like, I think. Any suggestion for, for a trader who, who wants to make, like, they're, maybe they're struggling right now, mm -hmm. right? In terms of they're focused on win, right? right? But at the same time, like, they just can't hold a winner. Mm -hmm. And, but you found success through basically going through that in terms of not really holding a winner, like sure. holding it for yeah. a long period of time. Definitely. So what would you suggest them to do or at least think about when it comes, like they're overly stressed about like, I need, I just need it. Cause I get messages all the time. Mm -hmm. As I, I'm always picking a stock, but I just can't hold it. And, it's, yeah. and I'm right. And right. I just take it off too soon. So any, any advice to those type of traders? I mean, there's no magic advice. Yeah. I, I think it's just, you got to find what, what you're comfortable with. If, if you're, I think too many traders are looking to get in and nail the top of a stock or the bottom and just I'm in and I'm going to like let it work and see what happens. It's like, man, it's not that easy. You like maybe catch the, the you know, the beginning part of that move uh, with some, some size where you only need to catch 10, 20% of that move. I mean, that's sort of how I approach it. Yeah. But a lot of other people, they don't approach it like that. So it's just whatever works for you. But I, and, you know, a lot of it's just analyzing your trades. Uh, I mean, using TraderView was a big help to me. Yep. Analyze, finding exactly where I make money. And really, I mean, I know, I've known forever that I lose money trading past, you know, hour past the open, I lose money. Like, 100%, I lose money. But when you actually put those trades into TraderView and then it shows you, you see that big red bar, <laughs> then you, yeah. it, it kind of drills it into you a little harder than just knowing it. So. Stuff like that, and uh, it's like the feelings confirmed through data. Yeah, so I, you know, sometimes I, I trade for twenty minutes at the open and I leave. And some people may think that's crazy, but I just know I'm going to lose money if I sit here and trade because it's just not where I make money. So I just just trying to focus on the times of day and the strategies that I make money, and forget everything else. And uh, you know, picking a good hobby helps. You know, poker helps because you know. A lot, of, a lot of traders can't trade for 20 minutes a day and, and then do nothing. And then do nothing. You, you know, you got to be a productive, you know, person, you know, go yeah. so I go play poker, go to the gym, kind of just try and get out and, uh, and do something and come back for the close. And, and uh, yeah, it's, that's, that's basically my, uh, it seems like dream. one of your biggest strengths is risk, mm -hmm. risk management. And it's been drilled in through this whole conversation. What was one of your biggest weaknesses? that was just like a real struggle for you. And whether it's psychology, whether it's process, whether it's just knowledge, whatever it may be. It's, yeah, uh, I would say just continuing to fight like when, when the day's not going well. Like I would never let one, I would never have one huge loser on the day, but sometimes you get in that rut where you have a loser, you know, and then you have another loser. And then sometimes it's just hard, hard to stop trading and I battle with that constantly. And uh, it never goes away. And I think I mentioned that last time. Like, I don't think you can completely cure yourself of that, but you can sort of avoid the triggers. And that's what, for me, leaving early is a big part of that, uh, is just not letting the, the day kind of escalate. Like, um, having a stop loss is huge. 
uh, that's one of the advantages of, of trading with Avatar, the prop firm, is you have these like stop losses that are set to where it keeps you from kind of losing control. Um, and that's one of the big benefits of I, I found with prop firms, uh, especially like Avatar. And um, well, I, I want to ask you this, man. And, and before we start to wrap this up, okay. I'd love to know because your journey is very unique. Where I mean, you had you know had quick success. Mm -hmm. Then you start to lose, right? Yeah. Then you had a lot more success, mm -hmm. and then an unnatural thing happens, yeah. right? And just some fluke, yeah. and takes and took you out mentally for a little bit, and yeah. you wanted to go try something else, and you come back. If you can go back to the past, though, and just tell yourself something to help you get through that a lot smoother, mm -hmm. right? Maybe not go through some of those rough patches. Mm -hmm. Is there anything you would tell yourself? I tell myself. That it's a long journey to to stay in the game and and stop like trading things that just aren't aren't what's working you know like mm -hmm. it's so easy to say that but when you're sitting in front of the screen for seven hours you find a reason to jump into something when it's not not something that's proven to be like successful for you so yeah. focus more on where I'm making money in the past and see how much I can push that and, and how aggressive I can be. And, and nowadays, I mean, I still have those bad days, but if I have a bad day by like being really big in, in the strategy that's worked for me and I lose, you know, you just, you shake it off because it's, you know, I followed what I, what's been working and it, it didn't work today and it's not gonna work sometimes, right? Yes. But if I have those days where I lose and I lose and I just keep fighting and, and just, you know, those are the days where I'm really disappointed in myself, and they still happen. Hopefully, they happen less, less and less. But uh, yeah, focus on on what what's works and and push it and see how big you can get and how uncomfortable you can get, because that's where you're going to make your money on mm. on on being big in strategies that have worked for you in the past. That and just kind of hanging around, waiting for those opportunities. That, that no matter what strategy you trade, there will be those opportunities. I mean, whether you trade small caps. There's gonna be some thousand percent runner, yep. And that's that's your that's your big win. For me, it's like a big a big trade like Shopify, something like that is gonna be for me what what keeps me around. And uh, and uh, yeah, that's basically all I can offer on that. Thanks, man. Hey, well, look, Michael, I appreciate it so much coming back, being able to give me some more time. Absolutely. I know it takes some time, so I appreciate that very much. Okay. Is there any place, if someone has any questions or wants to reach out? Yeah, I'm on Twitter, uh, Michael Swimilar, uh on Twitter. And, uh, yeah, if anyone that is looking to trade at a prop firm, we've got a great office in Austin and uh, looking to hire traders. And if anyone is interested and, and thinks they would, they would fit in well here, reach out to me or they can go to the website, avatarsecurities.com. And just love to, love to meet some traders and, and – uh, build a really cool cool office here awesome well you heard that from michael himself make sure to check him out we'll have his link down below and again michael thanks so much brother thanks Alex. good to see you good to see you man